Now that we've learned how to create parallel programs using async finish algorithmic notation or actually using the concrete Java fork join framework, we should pay attention to how we reason about the parallelism in the program. So let me go back to our standard divide and conquer example. In finish async notation, if we had S1, S2, S3, S4, what we would do is say async of S2 and then a finish around S2, S3, and that will enable S2 and S3 to run in parallel with each other. Now in the fork join pro uh, parallel programming framework, what you learned was you can get the same effect by doing S1, fork S2, S3, join S2, S4. So that's the concrete implementation of uh, the async finish parallelism using the fork join uh, programming framework. Now, we want to introduce an interesting concept called the computation graph to model parallel programs such as this. And the idea is we think in terms of the program executing dynamically. This graph is purely a mental abstraction. It does not actually get constructed or built when your program is running. But logically, we can think of um, statement S1 executing. And then after that, it does, if you look at the fork join version, it does a fork. So we have a fork over here of S2. And immediately after the fork, S1 can continue on to S3. So we call that a continue operation. And after S3, uh, the same task wants to continue on to S4. But there's this join over here. So for that, we have a different kind of edge called the join edge. So with these two, three kinds of edges, we see we can model the execution of this parallel program, and in fact, any parallel program, uh, as a graph that conceptually is built when uh, the program is executing. Each vertex or node of this directed graph represents a sequential subcomputation, something we refer to as a step, and each edge refers to an ordering constraint. If we just had a normal sequential program with no fork and join, our graph would just be a straight line with continue edges. But with parallelism, we see we have these fork edges and the join edges. Now here's the interesting property of the graph. If you want to reason about which statements can execute in parallel, we ask, is there a path of directed edges from one statement to another? So for example, there's a path from S2 and S4. So that tells us S2 and S4 cannot run in parallel uh, with each other. But between S2 and S3, we can see there's a parallel execution that's possible because there's no path of directive edges between S2 and S3. So that gives the basic property about what can run in parallel, and we can use it in multiple ways. It's a very handy abstraction to think in terms of debugging. For example, if by mistake in S3, uh, we were starting to try to read some sum computed by S2, and in S2, we were starting to write to that field sum, then we would have an error because the read and write could go in parallel with S2 and S3 not being connected with each other in the computation graph. There's no path of edges between them. That's a very pernicious kind of bug in parallel programming. That's called a data race. And that happens exactly when a reader and a write access or two write accesses to the same location can occur in different steps of the computation graph that may execute in parallel with each other. And you already know how to tell if they may execute. Another very interesting property of computation graphs is that we can use them to reason about the performance of your parallel program. So let's just say in abstract units, S1 took one unit of time, S3 takes 10, S2 takes 10, and S4 takes one. Uh, there are two important metrics that we will work with to reason about the performance. 
Uh, the first is called the work, at, and that similarly, uh, that simply the sum of the execution times of all the nodes. So in this case, it would be 1 plus 10 plus 10 plus 1, that's 22. Now, another metric that's uh, really important is called the span, and that's the length of the longest path. People also refer to these paths as critical path lengths. Sometimes you might say, hey, you're on my critical path if you're trying to get some work done. Um, so with the longest path, we have to take a look and see what's going on. We see that there's a path over here of length 12, and there's a path over here with length 12. So there are two paths with the uh, longest length, and that can happen, but the span is 12 because it's the length of the longest path. And uh, these two metrics help us reason about the parallelism in the program. So one of the things that uh, we will build on is this notion of ideal parallelism, which is work divided by span. It gives you a very concrete metric of how much parallelism is there in a computation graph. In this case, it's 22 by 12, which is quite modest. That's uh, just under a factor of two. For a sequential program, it would just be one because the span would be the same as the work. But what we will see is uh, for a rich set of parallel algorithms, the ideal parallelism can be really large of the order of thousands or millions and that allows us to take the same program and execute it on a wide range of uh, mu different multi-core processors and other forms of parallel computers.